Okay, welcome to the final days of Bayesian Statistics 5444. This is our last adventure together. So we will take a final exam next week. So that is posted on here. So this is a practice final that I'm going to give you. It's going to be eerily similar to the actual final. Um, I'm going to set a rule that if I get five people asking me how to do a problem on here, it's guaranteed not to be on the final exam. And I'll just substitute it out. So if I go and I tell you guys how to do it, that's not what I'm looking for. So um, all of this is totally doable based off of everything that we've done so far. So working through some base factor calculations, um, maybe doing a hypothesis test in there, setting up an SSBS algorithm. So if you can do the homework also, and work through that base factor, you're in really good shape. So I have you work through a base factor that's similar, that's a slightly different implementation. Um, some conditional expectation stuff, a little bit about Metropolis Hastings, what the rate parameter, what the rate is in Metropolis Hastings. We'll talk about that today. We'll write it down, just be really clear about it. A basic Bayes problem, how do you create an unbiased estimator? So, um, and then a two-sample testing problem. That's it. So we'll go through that in a minute. So again, if you guys, if, if I start giving out the solutions to this, I'll just come up with new problems. So I'll make minor adjustments to this. But it's meant to be, this is, this is the sort of stuff that you would think through when people present you with problems. You would kind of know the Bayesian machinery and know kind of like the, what the go-to moves are. So if you want to get really creative with things, that's called your PhD studies. So this isn't meant to be that. So nothing non-standard here. You're going to work under like conjugate priors, um, Jeffrey's priors, things like that. So there might be under the Jeffrey's prior, do this calculation. So there's a buried in Jeffrey's calculation. You probably know what it is off the top of your head. You probably just go grab it. You don't even have to derive it. OK, cool. Um, let's do some Metropolis Hastings detailed balance. So last time I showed you the detailed balance equation, I'm going to write it down just a little bit differently. So consider trying to sample from pi theta, I'll make this seem very Bayesian, this could be any distribution that you're trying to sample from. So it's conditional on some data. We'll just call that a distribution. And we'll let theta be continuous. If you want to think about it as something high dimensional, you can think of it as high dimensional. If you want to think about it as scalar, you can think about it that way. So everything I'm going to say is going to generalize. So that's our goal. What we might do is we might do Metropolis Hastings. So Metropolis Hastings is just iterating these two steps. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to propose. This is going to come from some proposed distribution. It's going to be conditional on maybe where we were last time. So it's allowed to be Markovian. We've seen examples of that. So and then I'm going to have an acceptance probability. So this is going to be the minimum of 1. I'm going to compare the ratio of the targets. I'm just kind of framing it like a Bayesian might use this thing. T minus 1, given X. And then I've got my inverse ratio of proposals. So this is G theta star given theta T minus 1. This is G T minus 1, oops, G theta T minus 1 given theta star. So, and then we accept with this probability. So theta t at the next step is going to be either theta star or theta t minus 1. So this will happen with probability alpha, and this happens with probability minus alpha. So it's just Bernoulli coin flip. So that's Metropolis Hastings. So 
Let's think about what detailed balance said. So this is a non-foreign concept to us. It kind of just looks like um, rules of total probability. So I'm going to write it down like this. I'm going to consider moving between two points. I'm going to call these theta prime and theta. So without loss of generality, I'm going to consider two points in my space. And if you don't like the two points that I've chosen, you can make them any old two points. So they live in my space, and I'm going to just consider transitioning between them in some Markovian fashion. I'm going to consider the propolis hastings algorithm, and what we're going to show is that the stationary distribution is the target. So this is what we want the stationary distribution is, to be. So what we're hoping is that when we iterate over this and we bury this in a for loop, that this thing converges to the posterior target. So this is kind of exactly backwards than the way they would teach this to you in a stochastic process class. So if you've ever had the pleasure, what they do is they say, here's a Markov transition matrix. Please figure out the stationary distribution. And there's lots of fun little problems that you can adapt to that. The umbrella problem is a, a goodie. So if you've ever seen that, you start with five umbrellas at your house, five umbrellas at your office, the rule is, is that you only take an umbrella between your house and your office, depending on if it's actually raining outside. So if it's not raining, you don't move the umbrella. If it is raining, then you move the umbrella. So you can set up the probabilities depending on it raining or not raining. So maybe we think that that's a constant. Obviously, that's not realistic. But doing a math problem doesn't have to be. So. We're not actually modeling reality in these problems. But the um, question is, is, what's the probability that all of your umbrellas will be at the other place in an absorbing state, and you aren't going to have an umbrella to move? And there's some probability of that. So what's the probability that your state would be no umbrellas? All the different states are all the umbrellas at differing houses. There's lots of ways to organize those 10 umbrellas. So we can figure out the probability of you getting wet, that's the stationary distribution, the long run average of this process. What's the probability that you're going to be at either your office or your house and not have an umbrella? So that's one of the states. So you're asking for what's the limiting distribution or what's the stationary distribution of the process? The trouble is Hastings is different. What we're doing is we are saying what the stationary distribution is and we're using an algorithm to march through a Markov chain that through its limiting distribution, if the limiting distribution exists, then it is the stationary distribution. So we're building a Markov chain and just iterating through it and letting that limiting distribution converge to something. What will it converge to? If it converges, it converges to the stationary distribution. I want to point out not all Markov chains have limiting distributions. So if they don't move around, get from anywhere to anywhere and they get trapped and they do it with funny patterns there's no guarantee this algorithm can move from anywhere to anywhere as long as my proposal can get me around the space so if my proposal is adapted correctly without any funny cycles or patterns then this can move anywhere in theta space so long as g covers it places prob positive probability on things and does it in a way that if I've left a state, I can still come back and find my time. So you had to try pretty hard um, to construct a G that didn't do that. The name of the game in MCMC land is to pick Gs that do that as fast as possible. Get you around the space, explore it, so on and so forth. So this is exactly backwards from the way they would teach in a stochastic process class. We know the stationary distribution. Give me an algorithm that constructs a Markov chain so that if I run through it, I'll arrive at that stationary distribution and it will ultimately sample from this stationary target. What we need to prove is that the stationary distribution for this Markov chain, this process, um, has that stationary target, the posterior distribution. Usually if you encoded this, you just put likelihood times prior in the numerator and denominator and you wouldn't even have to do any calculus. So the idea is how do you pick G 
how do you break this up into a GIP sampling format, so on and so forth, so that you can construct a efficient sampler. I've got a piece of chalk and a chalkboard. I don't care about all that. I care about the theory for a minute. I just want to show that conceptually it works. So this is the transition rate between moving between theta prime and theta. That's coming from the MH algorithm. Somehow this is generating a new sample that I can move to. So that might be theta prime. So what I would have had to do is propose theta prime to move there in the first place. And I would have had to start at theta. So theta in this example is theta t minus 1. And my theta prime is my theta star. So I'm imagining that I transition between them. Two things had to happen. I had to propose it, and I had to accept it. And I could figure out what that rate is by looking at those two steps. We'll inspect that in a second. This is the stationary distribution. I know this looks a lot like that, but not exactly. I'm going to keep the notation intentional. That This is usually what people write down right here, the stationary. Or I could just change it, if you'd like. I could call this S. So stationary. And we can prove that S is equal to that. That's what we will be proving. So this is the stationary distribution. This is the reverse transition. S theta prime. So the idea is that this distribution is the same. We will prove that when we use the MH algorithm to construct these transition rates, that S is our posterior. We'll prove S theta is equal to pi theta given x. So that would be what we're trying to get to, is that if we use this transition process, then we can derive that it converges to sampling from the posterior distribution. It's no great surprise. Pi's in here, so nothing miraculous is happening. Kind of makes sense. Is this the right rule? This is the 1954, 1957 Metropolis and Metropolis 18 papers proving this exactly. So that's our goal. We'll prove that. Let's just recycle this line and bury in what this stuff means. So let's work on this for a second. What is this right here? So this is the probability. Some of it's continuous, some of it's discrete, of transitioning between those two points. So instead of talking about probabilities or densities, because both things pop up in this problem, I'll just change the word to rate. So how fast do we move there? It has to do with the density and the probability, since they're conditionally independent steps product of together. So it just ask. So I'm going to just rewrite this just a little bit differently. I'm going to call this alpha theta star given theta t minus 1. There's going to be two different alphas that appear, so I'd like to make them specific. If we're going in both directions, we have to compute what that alpha is. So let me just ask, what's this? I'll help you out. Anybody that's ever passed a probability class knows the answer to this no matter how bashful you are. It's only your bashfulness that would make you get the wrong answer, I think. So all at once, what is the transition rate? Alpha. Alpha. Place those things right here with prime and theta to match that. Anything else? Probability that proposed Yeah, you gotta consider you proposed there in the first place, and there was some rate of doing that, some density function that controls that. What's the probability of transitioning in my in my 
continuous example is zero, but it doesn't mean it doesn't happen. So zero probability stuff happens all the time. So it has to do with this as well. So I did both things. So I've got G theta prime times that. So those are the two things I've done. They're not independent of each other. They're conditionally independent. So once I've done this and I've proposed theta prime, then I can talk about accepting it. How do I talk about doing both things simultaneously? I product those two things together. So that's just prob. I won't even call it 101. I'm going to call it prob 01. So you product these things together. When you see an and statement, you multiply together. So two things happen. So just like I'm saying with likelihoods, every time there's a stochastic move, there's a function in your formula that looks just like that. Same thing happens here. Stochastic process. Every time I do something stochastic, I've got a letter representing a function that is responsible for doing it. So if you ever want to encode a stochastic process into a likelihood, just follow the steps, product those things together. Make sure you deal with your conditioning properly. So that's it. Now, I don't exactly know what this number is. So it could be one of two things. It's either one or it's something that is different from one. So let me just ask, what can this number be? Zero to infinity. So it can do lots of stuff. It's something positive. Alpha isn't alpha bound by one to the min. Alpha is. So it's bounded by it, but I'm just asking about that second term in there. So that's something bigger than one. So if it's bigger than one, we don't care. You're accepting it. And I always code it up that way. So I never check the condition. I don't use the theory, but we'll use it here. Um, really, we're concerned about cases where that's less than one. So let's just impose a criterion right here. I'm going to say this. Pi, so I'll say without loss of generality, I'm going to know something. Pi theta prime given theta over G theta prime given theta is going to be greater or equal to pi theta given theta prime over g theta given theta prime. Hopefully you recognize this thing right here. This decision ratio is the ratio of these two creatures. So it's the same thing. I'm saying you give me theta and theta prime, and I'll tell you which one is bigger. So and I know which direction it is. It's one or the other. So it can be one of three things. They're equal to each other. That never happens. So, or it's bigger, it's less. All I'm saying is I know which way it is, then I only have to do one side of the proof. So if you'd like to do the other side, proceed. You'll get exactly this, the same proof. So I'm going to say I know that right there. So that's an assumption I've made. So now I can say something about this. What's that? One. That's one. Because this thing is bigger than that, and it's a ratio, so it's one. So now I know which one is one and which one is less than one. So we'll do the same thing. S theta is equal to this thing right here. We're just going to write down G theta given theta prime times alpha theta given theta prime. Same idea right here. That doesn't change. But this thing is either one or something else. If I go back to that same thing and I treat this consistently, now I know what alpha is. It's not greater than one. It's less than one because I've gone in the other direction. So if I were going to accept this thing, now I'm moving in the other direction. So I would have had to ask, how would I have proposed the other things? So this is like going backwards. How would I get back to that move that I've proposed away from and accepted? So to get back there, I need to consider that. So that's why I say MCMC is like life. You make a move, but you better consider 
coming back sometimes because maybe it's not a great move. So this thing right here is the ratio of these two things right here. So it's going to be the inverse of everything. That's how I have to go. So I'm going to look at this pi theta given x. Oh, this is weird, right? There's nothing like that on the board. That's our target. So I, I was trying to point to this and saying it was a ratio of this thing. I guess I could make that without loss of generality. I'm just talking about some other problem. <laughs> that's real. Absolute loss of all generality. This is the thing. So this would be the acceptance probability um, associated with that if you just take the ratio. Okay. Assume I said that correctly. So this is going to be this right here compared to pi theta prime given x. And now I've got these inverse probabilities. That thing is less than 1, so I'll write it down. In the other direction, going the other direction, it's greater than one. So basically, the reverse transition, we'd have to say a little bit more about that if we were in a rigorous math class. But I think it's OK to say things reversible. If I ran the algorithm in reverse, that would be the exact one. So we're not going to prove anything about that. Um, so that's it, right there. So times s theta prime. So now I can conjecture about what S theta has to be for this to be true. Well, <laughs> it could use the door. <laughs> and so we can set up the final step of all of this and do some cancellation. So I'll just point out that cancels with that. This one cancels with this one. Right here, this is just times one right here, so I never have to think about that again. And so I can look at this thing at the end of the day, and I notice that I need the S's to be picked in some particular way. This would be S theta prime here, so that this is equal. There's only one choice you can make. So let's just do it. So what is this? Let's make that pi theta given x. And let's just make this pi theta prime given x. That's pi theta prime given x. Now that one cancels that one. That one cancels this one. Both sides are equal to each other. And you could probably say this has to be true for all thetas out there in the whole space. This has to hold. So that only holds for one function. Proof. So that's it. That's detailed balance. If you want to show that this implies what the limiting distribution is as well, we had a definition of that. I've stated that this means it's the stationary distribution, but we could just fill in that proof as well. So if I just write down something like this, rho theta given theta prime times pi theta prime, I guess I did it the other way. Let's stick with the same convention. What? Prime, prime. So I can just plug in, that's the stationary distribution right here. So I can think about it that way. How am I making that jump right here? Just take a summation over theta, not theta prime, but this thing, rho theta prime given theta pi theta. Instead of summing like that, since I said I was in a continuous space, we'll sum like that. So this is going to be rho theta given theta prime, pi theta prime. So 
We'll integrate over theta. I'll make my notation like that. I've got to integrate over theta here as well. So what can I do? I pull this thing out. Right here, I integrate over this. This is a proper measure. Everything we dealt with were probabilities and rates, densities. So that integrates to one, this is Markov chain. So, so this part is pi theta prime. Get rid of that right here. This sums to one. And this looks like this. Compare this to this. A transpose pi is equal to pi. And the linear algebraic form that I wrote down before, this is exactly the same statement in continuous space. So where did we get A transpose pi is equal to pi? We just wrote down some basic probability equations last time and said that makes sense, and then we said those probability equations relate to transposing the Markov transition matrix, multiplying it into its steady state and arriving back at the steady state. This means exactly the same thing in high dimensional land, so that means that this is stationary. Voila, MCMC, whole class, all at once. So that's the missing step. So here's a freebie for you. On the practice final, I'm asking for identify the transition rate from Metropolis Hastings. We just did it. So you can make some statement without loss of generality, and then you write these things down. So the forward and backwards transitions. So there's a free one for you. So this was G times alpha, and you identify which alpha it is. It's either one or something less than one. And if you say you don't know, then you can do two directions of proofs and show that it works out in both directions, but there's a certain symmetry to this. So that's pretty cool. So this thing works. So that is the limiting distribution. That is the stationary distribution So that we're converging to. So the name of the game when you're constructing Metropolis Hastings rules is encode your algorithm, figure out what it means in terms of a rate, and show that this result works. And if you've done that, you've proved that your algorithm converges. After a while, you can just kind of see it through the symmetry. You don't have to do all the algebra. That might take 10 years. So, but I promise it will happen eventually. You can look at people's algos and go, no. <laughs> and what you're usually thinking about is how do you go backwards? And it's like, you don't have that built in. You're going to get trapped. So there's this question of how do you go backwards, and was that encoded right? Okay. Um, dear Slate Processes, you ready for another one? I, I usually hate seminars where it's like I get four talks at once. It's like I just need like 10 minutes before I can even stop thinking about what you just said. Oh, anyway, we've got 20 minutes. Why not go for another one? We'll just cram in Dear Slate Processes. Um, let me give you the pictorial version of this. It's actually a really easy thing to code up in some cases. Um, I would say conceptually, it's easy to code up um, in all cases. But in the conjugate analysis, it's really easy to do. So in the conjugate analysis, we can integrate over our parameter space and get rid of it. Out of everything, if you're not doing that, you have to sample from your parameter space and include another step in your Metropolis Hastings and carry those parameters with you. So very similar to the model selection problems we've done. I could have gotten the betas, the samples at every step, or I could try to include those in the model and not pre-integrate everything up front. And I would have just had to converge in that parameter space as well as the model space. I have more things that I'm trying to converge over. It takes more steps, more proposals, more iterations to just search around that whole entire space. Um, so I'm going to give you the easy version where we integrate out the parameter space so that we can see everything conceptually. If you cannot do this, you have another give step at every step where you sample the parameters. Okay. 
So let's say we think we have a useful modeling framework. We think of some, so maybe, like, here's an example. I'm going to say um, yi is equal to alpha plus beta xi's. i goes from 1 to n. So I'm just imagining this. I've got some model I want to, some data, and I want to fit a model to it. And that model means something. So let's pick a, an extraordinarily complicated model. So I could have made this easier. I just want to understand the means of everything. So I just want to know what y bars are. That would be equivalent to that question. And I think a lot of people do start out with this version of it, but I want to show you how to do this with regression. Um, you can apply this in unsupervised context where you don't have a yi, and it would be very similar to just removing the xi from our analysis. So I think I can two for one, this is a clustering algorithm or a clustering and regression algorithm simultaneously. If you want just the clustering version, remove this from the whole thing. And if you want the regression and clustering with, with regressions, include those. Supervised versus unsupervised learning, they all fall into the same camp if you know what regression is. Okay. Um, so I've got some likelihoods that I could build up. So I could do some analysis and build up what I think my thetas are. Theta is going to be alpha and beta, given my y x pairs. And I could build that up and try to fit everything and do a great job. Um, do some conjugate priors, maybe. So maybe I assume normal priors on alpha and beta and make them relatively diffuse. Or I use flat. Not going to be a great idea here. So we're going to have to stick with some proper prior to make this happen. And you'll see one in a second. So let's see I see data. Here's our data. Somebody tells me about regression. I think this is the greatest thing in the world. I want to fit every data set in the world according to this model. So it seemed to work once. should work all the time. And somebody shows me this data set. So they've got their Y's and they've got their X's. And they look like this. And let's not make them this big. So. your model. Let's make this look a little different so that we can kind of imagine what might be happening here. Let's take a forward view of how I generated the data in my mind. Maybe I had four different normal distributions. I grabbed some data you would have a hard time convincing me that that was normal. <laughs> so, um, you couldn't convince me. I need to see another point nearby it, you know? Otherwise, I would think maybe it's normal and you have low sample, but I can't really distinguish that from Cauchy. Okay, so if you didn't like that, um, I didn't say this, but you know, maybe this was normal. And maybe I thought that this was zero sigma squared. We're looking at this data and going, I don't think so. In any sort of diagnostics, if you fit the regression through this data set, I don't know what it would look like. Um, I'm unwilling to try. <laughs> maybe it's that. I don't actually know. So anyway, I know it's going to be horrible. That's obviously not a linear fit. But 
you might start speculating there's clusters in here, and there's groups. So how do you break up space and fit regression models to it? And there's lots of strategies to do this. Dirichlet processes are a way that you can bury into your Gibbs code to implement this. And here's how it goes. So I'm going to explain the algorithm without writing down all the pseudocode. So what I'm going to compute first is some number of groups. This is like k-means in this sense, but we're going to let that group number change. Okay, so here's going to be my algorithm is I'll start with some number of groups. I'll call it um, k. I'm going to say, I'm going to start with maybe um, two groups. And let's say I just fitted this. So I'm going to explain this in the context of what some people will call the Chinese restaurant process. So that is a synonym for an implementation of a Dirichlet process. There's different uh, metaphors out there. There's a state-breaking representation. They're the same things up to a truncation factor, but on a piece of paper and doing math theory, they're exactly the same. Implementation-wise, they are slightly different. Um, the idea is I'm going to imagine that these are two big tables, and I've seated a whole bunch of people at the tables. I don't want to generalize, because I've never seen a Chinese restaurant ever do this, ever. But the idea is, and somebody can help me out if this is right or wrong, um, that if you walk up to a Chinese restaurant somewhere and they don't have any tables available, they'll pull out a new table and seat you there. Because they want to cook you food. You're hungry. So we don't have tables. You have to wait. You don't have to wait. We will pull out a table at the back of the restaurant. You'll go there. Or we'll plop you down at some other table. Does that happen? OK, that happens. <laughs> so. I, I've just never seen this. But anyway, okay, there's some, there's some truth to this. Um, so we've seated everybody at these two tables. Now, we know that there's certain constraints. Some people won't get along with each other. So we might want to figure this out too. I don't know if they do this at Chinese restaurants if they have psychologists working around collecting data. But what we're going to do with these two groups is I'm going to form the posterior predictive distribution. So X tilde. And I can do this for this group, I'll call it one, right here. So k is equal to two, and there's two groups. Group one and group two. So this is all of the x's for group one. And this is all of the x's for group two. This is the posterior predictive distribution. How do we do this? I said we've got a conjugate analysis. Let's imagine we're all in the exponential family. If we're working with this problem, I can do the integrations. So I can figure out what these are up front. So fx tilde given theta, pi theta given x root 1, d theta. So I can compute these functions up front. So that's what I was saying is I'm going to give you the simplified version without carrying your parameters around. But if you didn't know how to do this integration, you could do that integration within the MCMC just by sampling the thetas from that group membership and figure out what goes there. We're going to have this other parameter out here. There's one other parameter. So I'm just going to say there's um, these things. There's n group 1 members to that table. There's n group 2 members in this table. So that's just the count of all of these people sitting at this table. There's one more parameter that I want you to be aware of in this very non-parametric algorithm. There's parameters everywhere. <laughs> so it's infinite dimensional in spirit. As you get more and more data, there'll be more and more clusters with more and more parameters. So the way that Bayesian likes to talk about that is saying it's non-parametric. 
the parameters don't mean anything to you necessarily. So I don't know. I don't know. I don't love the language, so I say it's Bayesian semi parametrics. So you'll hear people call it that too. It's not worth arguing over. So it's just a language thing. So I can compute all of these, and in spirit, however I open up tables, I can compute their posterior predictive distributions. There's one other parameter out there, it's called alpha. The bigger it is, the more likely we're going to open more tables. So this is going to be the control on the restaurant owner as to how many tables they like opening and how many members they like sitting at a table. So bigger means more. So this is something you might tune in your analysis. But what we found out through this class is your pariahs, if correctly, if reasonably diffused, they don't have a lot of impact. I took a student through a PhD, and we investigated lots of different ways of picking this alpha. We identified some people do do it weird, and it can have repercussions. We advocated for other ways of doing it, and it's very similar to other people. So um, if you pick it in some sort of empirical Bayesian fashion that we didn't get around to talk about, that's my favorite way of doing it. So, um, but you pick this to be something. And it's basically has some control. You probably want it to be dynamic in your code. If you have a lot of data, it won't matter that much. So in high dimensional spaces, um, you need more data to overcome that impact. So this might be something that a Bayesian researcher studies for a long time and says that it actually doesn't matter that much. And that's what I came to a conclusion to after about four years. <laughs> it doesn't make that much of a difference, but it can. So just like a lot of things. But I'm going to have this other thing right here. I'm also going to have um, my group sizes. I'm going to have N, G1, and N, G2. So this is going to act very similar to the group weight that I want to put on opening a new table. And it's going to be very similar to these fractions of data that we see sitting on at current tables. So this is the restaurant's propensity to open up the table right here. What I'm going to do in this algorithm is I'm going to now build an idea using all these mathematical concepts. So here's how the algo works. And I'm just going to iterate this without writing down any actual pseudocode. I'm going to pick a person at random from this data set, and I'm going to remove them. Let's say it's this person, so I'll just put an X where they were. Actually, I'm going to remove this person and put them back. I'm going to remove them from everything, from um, this whole construction. Then I'm going to reform this table. It's only considered to be seeing these, these members. I'm not thinking about that member for a second. And so I'm going to have a different size data set. That's that big. That's that big right here. So I'm removing them from group one. I'm going to reform this posterior predictive distribution with that member being left out. It's an analytical calculation. You just update the numbers in there. So you come up with a new posterior predictive distribution with this member being removed. This is exactly the same right here. But I'm just going to use the notation. I'm going to write down, I've got fx tilde given x. And I'm going to write down group 1 minus whoever this person is. I'll just call them little x. I don't know for sure. I picked about a group one when I code this up, so I'd like to make this a little bit arbitrary. I am removing them pictorially from that group. I'm going to write down something very similar right here. x tilde x group two minus x. In this scenario right here, I didn't subtract anything from that table. They're already removed. But I'd like to generalize that idea to in, that individual could have been at any table. So I picked them randomly. Now I'm going to work out one more probability. This is called the posterior, this is called the predictive distribution. Nobody would ever use it for prediction. I didn't introduce you to that language yet, but it looks like this. So fx tilde is this. 
times the prior. So not a posterior distribution on that. I usually call this the margin. So this is just the marginal distribution. I wouldn't use it for prediction. That'd be crazy. So, but sometimes people will talk about that. And I'm gonna multiply this here. So that's the marginal distribution. What I'm gonna do with this one individual that I've left out is I'm now gonna insert that individual into this equation. So this was just an arbitrary function over some hypothetical X tilde. Now I'm gonna use it to measure how well that member sits at all these different tables. So if that member sat at this table very well, we would expect that to be high. And if it had a lot of members in the table, that would have a lot of weight to it. So same thing here. Right here, we're gonna measure how well it fits at the table. So this is kind of a stochastic fit criterion that we're evolving. And then we're gonna see how well it fits just somewhere else. And so there's this option to have this individual move to their own table. So if it doesn't fit anywhere else, then maybe it should be its own um, entity. So let's now sample multinomially with probabilities proportional to those three things. So what are the denominators? They look like this, alpha plus ng1, I'll just say plus n minus one. That's the best way to put it. So over alpha plus n minus one, over alpha plus n minus one. Where's the minus one coming from? It's the member that we've removed. So that's x that's, we're now seeing how well it fits at the other tables. So this is the psychologist walking around the restaurant going, what are you into politically? What are your views on the world? Oh, we better move you real quick. <laughs> You're sitting by somebody totally different and this is gonna explode. So that's what this is measuring right here. Does it fit somewhere else better? So I'm gonna sample with these probabilities right here. If I sample this object, maybe that probability was high, I'll stick it right back at table one. If it fits better here, then I'd stick it at table two or maybe it fits somewhere differently. Let's imagine that I do this three-sided coin flip and I pick this thing right here, it landed on that side. What would happen at the next iteration is I would have this one person sitting at their own table and now I have three groups. Now I'm gonna repeat the idea and I'm gonna do it over and over and over again until it converges. So if I have an individual that I pick out of a table. Let's imagine that's an individual right there. Let's imagine this one right here. I pick them out right here. And let's say it's some step of the algorithm they're sitting at their own table. I collapse that table. I just remove the table, see if it fits somewhere else, and I remove where that table's going to be. And that's it. You just keep cycling over that idea over and over and over again. That is a Dirichlet process, so it will converge to the number of clusters. And it will also fit models simultaneously. If you want to just think of this as a clustering algorithm, just remember the X size. But you can do this with functional data as well. You could do this with Gaussian processes. You could do it with any function that you wanted to. That's kind of a cool thing. So what happens, so if you just have a single number at a table uh, and you're calculating those probabilities, I'm a little bit confused about how you do that because if you take that one thing out, there's nothing left. Then that table's collapsed and we're not even considering oh, okay. it. Oh, okay. So we moved it. So if there were two members at the table, then that table would still be there if you removed one of its members. Right, but like then, let's say in a step you added somebody to a new table by themselves. Okay, let's say I got down here. This is probably what would have happened in the algo is that eventually, let's just imagine some iterations, eventually I figure out, oh, they all look to get like the same. And I start stacking them at their own tables and I've done this. Let's say it's some iteration, it looks like this, that would, it's pretty obvious. But this one's not too optimistic. Your Dirichlet process thing should pick out, that does not sit with anything else. So it's kind of outlier to that. I will say one thing about my research and some other people's research, 
If you pick this to be the expectation of the number of clusters you see in some normalized fashion, and you do this sort of thing, outliers will start making new clusters, and you'll end up saying the probability is high of creating new clusters, and you'll start shattering clusters that exist in your data. That was the thesis. So don't do that, <laughs> you know? So there has to be some control over that. So, oh, sorry. so let's imagine we're here. This was the scenario. So they're sitting at their own table, as they probably should. They don't look like anybody else. This is me. So I'll go sit at my own table. Thank you very much. <laughs> this is like half of us, probably. So what happens? They get up. Now I remove them for a second. That table's gone. Now I go back to these equations right here. It wasn't here, it wasn't here in the first place. So it's got these thing, this thing, I'll call this group one. This is group two, this is group three. This table doesn't exist anymore. So now I have f of x, x group threes right here. So I'm gonna plug them in. It'll have some number of members. So at this step of the algorithm, I'd be considering this. There's three tables. That one we've removed temporarily. So the Chinese um, restaurant owner comes over and says, get out of your table real quick. I want to see if you fit anywhere. <laughs> they make you stand up for a minute. Where'd my food go? And they go and scan the room. What would happen? It probably would put it still at some other table. It would probably end up putting you right back in the same location. So it probably wouldn't place a lot of probability on sticking you here because it doesn't look like any of those. It doesn't fit the predictive distribution. So if you think about predictive distribution having tails, which it does, it's way off in the tails of those distributions. You could imagine those distributions using this picture as just being these, you know, multi-dimensional normals. Oh, no. So what are we doing at the end of the day? We're fitting three different regression models, or a bunch of different regression models, and you can do whatever you want with that one. So you'll fit some regression model. It'll be kind of crazy. You better know your variances to be able to do this. If you used improper priors on that, that thing for the variance, it won't work very well. So outliers will mess up that kind of stuff. So Dirichlet processes with lots of outliers, lots of clustering algorithms have problems. So lots of people study that. You know, data is getting messier and messier because we can capture it quicker and quicker. I did this with housing data. So Zillow type stuff. And it had a um, competition to see if Zillow was biased, truly on Zillow. So some people were accusing them of undervaluing their houses. You put that online, now people won't pay less. So did they discriminate was the question. The answer is, is they're all messed up, but it doesn't look like it's systematic bias. <laughs> so what they do is they scrape stuff in weird ways. That can mess stuff up. It's all very automated. Sometimes you see a house somewhere, and it says it's got a, a million square feet. And so the price of the house should be $300 billion. That will happen. And that really messes up a lot of the analyses. So that was kind of the first step of how do we just filter through the garbage of this. And that became a thesis in itself. There was another question. So uh, does this relate in any way to Gaussian mixture models? Uh, yes. Yeah. This would be an infinite Gaussian mixture model. So this is an infinite representation of a Gaussian mixture model. So yeah, absolutely. The difference here is if we were doing MCMC on just a finite Gaussian mixture model, I have to pre-select K. And it stays so this, there. Would, would you say this is like a more flexible version of that because you totally. don't, you're not pre-selecting K? Yeah. And then K means would be an even more primitive approach. Yeah, so I would say K means fits into the Gaussian mixture model framework. So it ties it all together. It's just using the same variances for every cluster. So that's what k-means does. So k-means can fail spectacularly if you have a little cluster like this and a big blob right next to it. Is if you see a point right in the middle of it, if you did something like this, let's say I have some data. There's one cluster. 
I'm going to bisect that line right here so I see the decision rule in k-means. And let's imagine I have another cluster of data that looked just like this. We won't even put in ovals or anything. We'll make them circles. That's assuming the clusters are circles. K-means does great with the same variances. If you saw a point right here, and you ask the question, which cluster do you think it's in? Where would k-means put it? It put it in this one. Where would you put it? I'd put it in that one because there's larger variance. So there's the uh, you know um, Mahalanobis distance that you could drop into a k-means algorithm and fix that up. That's like a Gaussian mixture model, and this is a more flexible version of that. So I see them. Yeah, they're all kind of aligned in that same paradigm. So if you think about it model based, you can compare all these different algorithms to each other. I like thinking because it puts it into a common framework. Cool. Awesome, you guys. That's the end of class. I think I'll hand out this practice final. Sorry that we've gone over. Might be worth it to get this. Okay, this does have a few instructions. Our final exam is Wednesday, 10.05, 12.05. Um, it's here. Also due on the final exam are homework five, only the SSVS implementation and results for the three data sets um, provided. That's all you need to turn in. And any extra credit you choose to do in the class. So there's been ample offers for extra credit. Any corrections you want me to look at as I'm considering your grade, I do consider everything to show. So my goal is to get you to learn base. So there's lots of different pathways to do that. Okay, let's just look at it real quickly. You might get something like this on the upcoming Wednesday. Regression model, we're familiar with that. We can write it lots of different ways using the conjugate prior, show that the posterior distribution. So this is the beta j's, given the beta minus j's. In the implementation we did in class, we wrote it down with integrating out the minus j's. So this is just like it, but you're gonna carry the betas with you. So slight extension, a little bit harder to code up. You don't need to code it up for this. It's just a math problem. Using the conjugate prior, show that the posterior distribution is normally distributed. That shouldn't be hard. So find both the expectations and the variances of these. This is quadratic term minus two linear term stuff, just in a different framework. Under the point mass mixture prior, verify that the base factor for testing beta j is equal to zero versus given all the other beta j's can be written is the ratio of these two normals. That's supposed to represent their density functions. Hopefully you know the notation. So that n0 divided by n0, those are normal densities. Okay, so you'll be working through everything and you can write that down rather easily. So you're just verifying that. Make sure you understand what's in the numerator and the denominator. That's the only trick to the problem. Sometimes people write that stuff upside down from the way you might write it down. So, part A, show how to implement the stochastic search variable selection algorithm for selecting nested models, blah, 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 blah. That's your homework. Just write the pseudocode. Show how to modify your SSVS algorithm if you learn that the epsilon i's were Cauchy. That's maybe introducing a latent factor that's gamma distributed and integrating over that in your code. You probably wouldn't want to encode Cauchy likelihoods. Yui. Yui. Oh. You want to come drop off our marks? Yes. Or pick them up for everybody, I guess is the, the name of the game, right? So, is Huey picking up homework today? So, give him, give him a second. So, under the Metropolis Hastings rule, um, write down the transition rates. That's what we did on the board today. Problem four, let Xi be uniformly distributed. I've asked this question a lot. It turns out there's a K that you can choose for that prior 
to make the expectation of everything unbiased. So you're going to figure out which K makes the analysis unbiased. Um, this is two sample testing, so it's just an extension of all of our hypothesis testing. Instead of setting theta equal to zero, we're going to be looking at the difference between two things and setting it equal to zero. So I have a couple problems on here where I make some assumptions about sigmas. That's important. And then I think I asked for the last problem, how do you do hypothesis testing in the case where we're doing the one-sided test? So it's actually not too hard. That's it. If you can do all of that, I will be impressed, I will be happy, and you will be happy. Awesome. On that note, um, you is here to collect your homework. So you can hand them off to him, and I will see you on Wednesday. Awesome events. If you have any trouble or anything like that, or if you have any emergencies, just email me and I'll get